Why we love the Tang Dynasty, exploring the history and charm of what's seen as one of the greatest imperial dynasties in Chinese history. Episode 12, The Tang Musical Extravaganzas. In this episode, we'll discover the changing musical tastes of the Tang Dynasty, which at one point would have put Hollywood musicals to shame. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we're getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it was possibly the most prosperous, interconnected and innovative country in the world, with a rich and influential legacy that survives to this day. It is perhaps inevitable that, as a melting pot of culture, the Tang Dynasty would see a flourishing of the arts, literature and music. The empire was growing. If Tang forces didn't invade, then they subjugated. Or maybe countries simply decided that it was best to pay tribute to the Tang as their natural leaders. So they sent musicians and dancers as gifts. Persians, Arabs, Indians and people from the Malay Peninsula were to be found in foreign quarters of the city and every new caravan of traders brought ever fresher faces, ways of living and methods of expression. Mixed with the many voices, you would hear a wider range of instruments. Bells, stone chimes, flutes, drums and zithers, plus large bands of courtly dancers. There was a feel-good factor in the empire, and this spread into the musical scene too, where the formality of the courts gave way to exuberance. But whereas we can see the art and calligraphy of the dynasty and read the books and poems, how do we know what the music of the tongue would have sounded like? And apart from entertainment, how did this rich musical heritage express itself within Tang society generally? Once again, the key in the development of Tang culture was the role of the imperial court. The arts and artistic expression were highly valued in the Tang dynasty. As an emperor, it was beholden upon you to be accomplished and many of the Tang leaders were keen painters, calligraphers, composers and musicians. And because whatever they did, the people wanted to do too, that enthusiasm for the arts and music filtered down through society. But it didn't end there. Just like today's online influencers, they sought to guide the people in their skills and tastes. Emperor Gao Tsung of Tang, Li Zhe, was especially directive. He wrote a book of music where he outlined his reasoning that the most important thing was sound. And that encompassed not just music played on instruments, but also the human voice and the words they would sing and the way all this was performed. None of these elements was enough on its own. It was like a painting in only one colour. You needed all the colours of this sound rainbow in order to get the full effect. The voice had to be trusted into the hands of poetry. And likewise, poetry could only be enhanced if it was performed beautifully by the human voice. The emperor looked around and saw that the most effective music involved voice, movement and even ritual. Songs at the banquet, devotional songs in temples, folk dance performances at court. And here we see the beginnings of two very important strands of music, the Tzu poetry, which was sung, and which flourished especially later in the Song dynasty, but also the art form we recognise today as Chinese opera. Emperor Xuanzong created the first national opera troupe, which was called the Pear Garden. And in fact, Chinese opera performers are sometimes still referred to as the disciples of the Pear Garden. 
continuing to perform hundreds of different forms of Chinese opera. In keeping with the courtly ideals of music, Chinese opera combines characters, storyline, makeup, and dance. Many poets also like to incorporate poems into the music to enrich the story of the music. So, the colourful, unique Chinese opera of today, some types of which have been added to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List, perhaps gives us echoes of the way popular music in the Tang Dynasty might have sounded. But there are other clues too. As we have already discussed, the cultural ebb and flow of the Tang Dynasty meant also that Tang tastes in music and art spread out from the empire where it flourished and embedded itself in local cultures, especially Korea and Japan. Hundreds of young men and women were trained in dance and music at the Academy of the Pear Garden. Tang poets wrote of the dance of the rainbow skirt and feathered jacket and described how dancers used their long silk sleeves to accentuate their hand movements. This kind of sleeve dancing was also depicted in sculptures and Buddhist cave art from the Tang period. During the reign of Empress Wenzong, thousands studied at the Imperial Music Academy and hundreds of the best musicians resided at the palace. Such trainees were often female, they followed in an earlier tradition of court girls whose basic duties were to entertain distinguished guests. As you might expect with the Tang Penchant for organization, music soon became a project on which the dynasty wanted to see order. And they started with tidying up the music for rituals, which had largely been defined by earlier dynasties along Confucian lines. Confucius, apart from being a great philosopher, was also a talented musician and influenced traditional Chinese music for thousands of years. Music was to be simple, peaceful, and suit the conduct of the ceremony it was being played in. For example, there was music for sacrifice, funerals, ritual, military, giving and weddings. It all had to match up with Confucian ideals. A quick note here about the sound of the music in the Tang period. Chinese traditional music has a different tonality to most Western music. There is no octave, but instead five notes, a pentatonic scale. Music theory was all very good, but music always finds its level. There was hardly a tavern in the capital that didn't have a female singer or dancer from what was known as the Western Regions, which basically was anywhere west of the Great Wall, accompanied with their own foreign musicians. For some, it was too much. The Tang poet Yuan Jun once lamented about the air pollution created by Western horsemen, about the ladies who studied only Western fashion and makeup, and entertainers who devoted themselves to only Western music. Popular tunes of the period included South India and Watching the Moon in Brahman Land, performed by exotic dancing boys or girls. One dance troupe from what is now Uzbekistan caught the eye of Emperor Xuanzong because of their crimson robes, green pants, and red deerskin boots, and for the way they twirled on top of balls. Others from the city today called Tashkent inspired the poet Bai Ju Yi with their dance that involved emerging from artificial lotuses and pulling down their blouses to show their shoulders. Racy stuff.
Emperor Taizong's big contribution to Tang music was the big production song and dance number. The battle line smashing song. Think Busby Berkeley movies in the 1930s. What started as a military song to celebrate a great battle over time grew in size and ambition until it had to be performed outside the capital's Xuanwu Gate. At its peak, there were 120 dancers dressed in armor, armed with halberds. The performance was said to be very realistic, with battle scenes and authentic stabbing movements. It influenced later generations, who favored large bands, huge casts, dramatic settings, and big dance routines. Drumming could be heard for great distances. A similarly grandiose piece was called Music of Grand Victory, which was credited to the next Tang Emperor Gao Tsung. There was also the imperial birthday music, in which the dancers moved into a formation representing the characters meaning long live the emperor in the best modern marching band tradition. A banquet song was a piece supposedly composed by the Empress Wu Zetian in honor of her pet parrot, who, it said, frequently called out, long live her majesty. Inevitably, all this showiness and imported music prompted a backlash. Government officials waded in, initially categorizing the music into courtly, common, and foreign. That was further divided into 10 different performance types, which included groups of instrumentalists from Samarkand and Uzbekistan, various points along the Silk Road and defeated kingdoms in Korea. One group was charged with maintaining the old styles of Chinese folk music, so there clearly must have been some concern that indigenous music was under threat from imported sounds. One thing is certain, the musical life of the Tang was anything but boring. Its flowering set the scene for the centuries that followed, with its influence still felt across much of Asia today. Special thanks go out to San Lien Zhongdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time.